Hello. Awaken your inner pterosaur and swoop into Module 1 of Survival Analysis. A bird's eye view. I'm Mark Williamson for Dakota at UND. So let's get ready to survive. What is survival analysis, you may be asking yourself? Well, that's a great question here. Fundamentally, it is time to event data. That is, you have a cohort, a group of people, products, animals, whatever, and you measure them over time for some sort of an event. Now, because this is survival analysis, that event is typically death, but it can also be things like disease, tumor growth, uh, failure of, say, a device, uh, bankruptcy, etc. Depends on the topic. And survival analysis is very important for a lot of different fields, including epidemiology, engineering, economics, etc. Now, since I am a statistician for an epidemiology core, I will focus on epidemiological examples. So then, survival analysis can be used in three typical ways, kind of broadly speaking here. The first one is the survival time of a group. You can look at it this way, where you're going to have your survival, I'm just going to call it S on your y-axis, and then time on our x-axis. You might look at how the group survives. Typically, you would use something like a capital mirror curve. We'll look at those later, but it'll look something like this. As every individual dies, the curve drops a little bit, and you can get survival time. You can also look at survival time across groups. So maybe you have one group here, but then you have another group here. And you can do statistical tests to see if these two survival times are different. Then you can also do survival time based on factors. You might be looking at th things like age, uh, treatment, uh, gender, ethnicity, something like that. Sort of like a regression. In fact, it's called Cox regression, where you see if different factors have a differential effect on survival time. Okay, and now more broadly speaking again with survival analysis, typical approaches to do survival analysis are visualizations through survival curves like I've shown here. And then modeling using methods such as the log rate test or Cox regression. And we'll dive into those details as we move on. So some important terms that come up are event, time, censoring, survival function and hazard function. And again, we'll discuss all of these in more detail. So let's now talk about the basic rules of survival. And I've adapted these from this great resource here at three. So the first rule is no one starts out dead. So when you're looking at survival analysis, whatever group you're looking at, the survival is always at, you know, 100%, they all start out alive. But then as you go on, as you see these curves, everyone dies eventually. That is, if you took time out to infinity, these will all drop down to zero. Now, practically speaking, this often doesn't occur because you are you have a time frame you look at, and you might not be able to capture all the events in the time frame, but if you stretch out long enough, it will drop to zero. Then the third thing here is that once you're dead, you stay dead. So the survival function, the survival, it only decreases. You don't, you never see something like suddenly sort of like shoot up again or, or anything like that. That once you die, once an event happens, it's permanent. So these curves only decrease. So this is, this is incorrect. Okay there. Aha, uh -huh. here is our landscape of what we'll be covering in modules two and three. So the core concepts of survival time of a group, across groups, and effect of factors. So for survival time of a group, we have individual outcomes, life tables, Kaplan-Muir curve, survival function, and hazard function. Across groups, we'll look at multiple Kaplan-Muir curves because there are multiple groups, and the log rank test. For factors, we'll have survival trees, random forests, other covariate models, and Cox proportional hazards regression, colloquially known as Cox regression. 
So a little bit of a key here. We have concepts in gray, models and functions in green, typical graphs in orange, and then other visuals in yellow. So now let's decompose our first survival times concept and take a look at some examples. So for individual outcomes, there's helpful ways to visualize what it looks like. So here's a great example. We have subjects one through 10. And for all of them across years, they're going to have either a, what's called a sensor or an event. Now event we've already talked about, that's usually something like death occurring, where a sensor is when that event doesn't occur, either through one, they make it, they survive through the study, like seven, seven and six here, you see they, they're still alive at the end of our sort of study time. Whereas other ones we see here are cut short. They didn't die, but they are no longer being observed. They like dropped out of the study or so forth. So you can either have a sensor or event for your subjects. Here's another simpler example. You can see here we had one, two, three, four, five. One survived to the end of the study, one dropped out, and then three had events, three died. So from individual outcomes, taking that data and transforming it into another format, we can get life tables. Life tables take so sort of the raw data, so we have the different individuals, their years in the trial, whether they died or not, and we can translate that into a, a the sequence of time and then who died at each sort of interval of time. So time, number died during that time, n is like the number at risk. And then you can calculate one minus death over those at risk. And then you can, from there, you can get this iterative survival function. So this is the simplest example. So we just had years and the number died. You can have more complicated models. You can get more complicated things than the survival function. This is some nematode data I worked out in my under my graduate work. You have things like number of days, living individuals, survivorship, death. And since I also looked at reproduction, so we have like reproductive uh, indexes. So that, that's, uh, th that's those two yellow ones. Let's turn to our very important Kaplan-Muir curves. So this is ubiquitous in survival analysis. It's this, this curve that falls down that shows survival probability over time, days, months, years, etc. And so the Kaplan-Muir curve follows that cohort and it'll theoretically go to zero if you go on far enough. Now, interesting things you can do, which is the Kaplan-Muir curve, you can get sort of survival probability at certain times. So say this is at a year, the probability is a little bit under 50%. And you can see these uh, sort of little hashes here. These are actually uh, typical notation for sensor data. So you can see there, those were like individuals dropped out of the study prior to its completion. Okay, so outside the Kaplan Mirror, let's get into some math. Oh, my, my mistake, here's a simpler Kaplan Mirror curve, one you can actually calculate by hand in Excel. Same sort of thing though, you see it each time it drops that was where some individuals died. Okay, well, so with the survival function, so these are, these are smooth examples of it, whereas the Kaplan Mirror is essentially a survival function, but it's non-parametric, it's choppy. So fundamentally what happens is a survival function, it starts at zero and it, or starts at one and it drops to zero in some sort of manner. Whereas a hazard function on the other hand does not go from one to zero. It, it tip, uh, typically can be really any number, any number, but it shows the relative hazard at a certain time as time increased. So what it's saying here, you see this curve, a lot of people died right away and then it sort of smoothed out. So what this hazard function shows is that there's a high hazard at the beginning and it kind of falls off as you go on farther. Now hazard functions are good as it is, but another even more, uh, often more helpful visual tool is the cumulative hazard function. It shows how much the hazard accumulates. So here is that example here for the same data. We see here again, it sort of shoots up pretty quickly at the beginning here to show that you have a lot of hazards early on. And then it kind of slows out as we see this slow, 
the sort of smoothing survival curve that i mean as you go on it gets higher and higher and higher until eventually it'd be like a hazard of one where you know everyone is going to die but that uh, that is how that goes and again these are just graphs you can calculate them both for discrete data so like discrete hazard functions and also uh, the sort of smooth uh, continuous functions okay let's turn our attention to survivor times compared across groups it's a very very similar to our first one though with a little more bells and whistles so again just because we have multiple groups doesn't mean we can't have multiple kaplan mirror curves which we can so you simply have them plotted like this for example like a treatment so or chemo this is before or after surgery we see that those with chemo before surgery had seem seems to have worse outcomes than those who had chemo after after surgery and you don't even need to stop at two you can actually look at really as many as you want so these are groups a through e and uh, survival and then time you can see like say group a had the best survival had actually at the end of the study was like over 50 percent survival whereas group e everyone died by well less than even 60 months so they're very useful for for visualizing now if you want to actually say is there a statistical difference between say these two groups we can do a formal test it's called the log rank test there's other similar tests but that's the most common one and it this is the the math going on with it it's essentially a, a chi-squared test observed over expected we don't need to go into the details but typically like for example you see in this graph here it'll give a p-value with the test statistic and it'll tell you whether it's significant so there's a significant difference in at least one group here not surprising giving that big spread okay now on to our effects of factors on survival times so let's start with survival trees it looks like something like this so just like in other analyses you could do a regression style analysis or a tree-based analysis this is a tree-based analysis for survival also known as survival trees it's where you have a bunch of different factors maybe you know age or, or gender or tumor progression or some sort of serum level whatever you know a bunch of different variables and you can based on different criteria of those variables you can try to separate out different different groups I really like this example here from from 10 because they create different nodes so it looks like this t and m stage so stage three was very different from these two and that had a most most of the deaths or cases and then looks like age was the next important so older age then was important and then from there was certain genotypes and they're about the same but what was really cool about this is it shows the nodes but you could actually still then plot with traditional kaplan mirror curves those different nodes and you can see uh, real differences that node one had the worst survival where nodes like three and four were, were pretty similar to each other so that's survival trees now survival random forces is the logical extension so instead of having just one tree you do a bunch of trees and sort of average them together there's not really a good picture for that so instead i have this sort of data on uh prediction error because your trees you're trying to be highly um, accurate in predicting and so if there's high error it means it's unreliable so here are the comparisons between different types of trees so this is just a one tree so a single tree a saturated tree so it has as many branches you can see how if you have a training set that you kind of build this tree on and then your actual test set we can see that there's a pretty big difference with this which is bad uh, not very good prediction a prune tree where you sort of cut down this is still just a single tree you cut down the air is better but if you have this random survival force maybe so this may even be like 100 trees or 100 plus trees we see that that correspondence of error between the actual training set and our test set is very close which gives us a lot better confidence in our trees results so there you have that I will erase this here before we try to pop something else out. Now, again, I said 
There's tree-based methods, and then there's regression-based methods. So let's turn to Cox proportional hazard regression, also known as Cox regression. This is very common. This is, again, the sort of an extension. Instead of like single regression or like ANOVA, multiple regression, you can have a bunch of different factors. That's kind of what Cox regression is. You have different risk factors, and you can see if they're significant in predicting survival. And then we typically output that through what's called a hazard ratio. It's sort of like a log odds if you're used to logistic regression odds ratio. It just tells us um, how much higher the hazards are, so how much more likely you are to have an event like death given the risk factor. So they can be continuous, like say age. So this you have your test statistic and a p-value, so the age was significant, and then the hazard ratio is 1.12. So given this continuous variable, the higher the age, the more likely you are able to have a, more likely you are to have the hazard. So have the event of death. That makes sense. So, and then you, you know this is significant because these confidence intervals should be outside of one, either above or below one. So this is significantly above one. So a little bit higher risk of hazard ratio as age increases. And you can also have categorical like sex. So the male sex compared to females was again significant and then the hazard ratios were higher so males were almost one and a half times higher hazards of death compared to females i'll look in some of the other one blood pressure significant current smoker this looks like that was the strongest smokers were over twice as likely to have death uh, tw twice as hazard and then there's some things that weren't significant you can see that they weren't significant because the p-values were not greater than 0 0.05 and also because the hazard ratios this it overlaps one so there's no evidence that it's any different from one so a hazard ratio of one means there's there's no difference from from it okay so then there's a lot of other covariate models including specific models we'll look at it in three and uh here are just some examples so Cox regression is what's called semi-parametric, and we'll get to that later, while the Kaplan mirror is non-parametric. But there are actually parametric, where if you want to get sort of smooth survival curves. So you can use things like wobble distributions, et cetera, and we'll cover that later. And there's other sorts of things like the cellular life models, proportional hazards, proportional odds. And again, there, there are other very specific sort of covariate models or other more general models that we'll talk about, especially in module three. Okay, with that, we've sort of covered the gamut of, of what survival analysis entails and what you have to wet your whistle on as we move forward. But now let's take some visceral data to sort of get our head around if we're not quite getting how survival analysis works yet. Because that thing I really like about survival analysis is at sort of its core, it's pretty it's pretty intuitive once you kind of capture what's going on. So what, we're going to generate some data here. So here is my data. I have 12 different dinosaurs. I'm just IDing them 1 through 12. That not terribly important, but kind of gives you a feel for it. So what I'm going to do to these dinosaurs, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to subject, subject those dinosaurs to a shaking trial, where if they fall off, they are dead. So let's get started here. Okay, they're shaking. It'll go about 60 seconds. So we'll record the deaths as we go. We're shaking. Okay, it's not too bad now. They're doing okay, but wait. Oh, oh, there's our first death. And second falls pretty quickly on. There's another one. Oh, getting a little more intense now. More shaking here. Up. And it's a little hard to see, but three fell there at that point. Another one. And another one there. Oh. There we go, another one. All right, just three left. They're all carnivores. Strong showing there. And we have another one off. Oh, two. And oh, just one left. Dilophosaurus is holding strong. Can he make the 60 sex ball? No, he can't. He can't. And with that, the 60 seconds leave us at no survivor. So that is our data. Let's examine this in Excel to start with, because you can do a lot of this stuff by hand. So here is our 
data our 12 dinosaurs and i of course i know pterosaurs aren't technically dinosaurs but we'll just lump them in for right now the different times and then the status now they all died so they're all one there was no zeros and then i can translate that into like i kind of was keeping tally as we went through iterative time going from zero to 50 and then the, at the different times when they died get the numbers this is again numbers at risk so at time 13 one died out of the 12 that were at risk whereas down to 31 there's only four left so one died out of the four that were at risk you get the one minus death over the number and you'll see that will drop down to zero and then survival function is just essentially the previous survival function multiplied by this number so there's one and then one multiplied by this is this and then this multiplied by this is this and so on and so forth and down to zero since we had a time that include all events and then what we can do is we can move things here and how this is set up is essentially each other than at time zero all the time points have two points so we can have the survival function and then the next survival function so we can get that drop off here and if we highlight all this do scatter plot and then the scatter with the lines we'll get our function here and it looks pretty nice we can see it starts out at one then they start dying in droves and then uh, the last one dies at about time 50. so that's a quick example in excel but we can do better than that let's switch over to our good friend r now i have a, a csv called dino survival with this da data and i'll print it off just to show you that it's true so time id time or sorry type id time and status and from there we can do a survival curve using this serve fit from a library survival and if we do that here it looks like this pretty nice here we actually have some confidence intervals and looks very similar to the excel plot but we can do better than that we can in fact do some of those parametric curves i talked about if we want to get a better approximation if we want to sort of predict things later or something or enter sort of data anyways i'm i'm rambling so this one time we're using serverect but we're using this exponential distribution and then i have to do some stuff here to essentially pull out information to fit fit a curve i'm not going to go into the details here but what it gives us is this which doesn't look great it doesn't really fit our our kaplan mirror curve very well so let's try again let's use instead the weibull distribution we'll have to get some data out to create this curve and when we get this purple curve hey that actually looks pretty good it, it fits our data pretty well slow pretty high survival rates are now then it really drops especially around the 30 mark and then it sort of levels off as it goes to zero so great you know that that was a great example but you know that's not all let's switch over to our maybe less familiar friend sass again we're going to have our dino survival and this time i'm actually going to add additional data i'm going to set a factor or a group i'll set some of them as carnivores and others as herbivores and we can pop this out here we see the pterosaurs and then those theropods i'm just called carnosaurs or carnivores they're all carnivores and then the rest are herbivores why did i do this well i did this because well first we'll just do a quick survival function looks great looks pretty normal but then i want to do another one but strata stratiate it or have a strata that is group it by our diet so we can have multiple kaplan mirror curves and look at that you see the carnivores in blue the herbivores in red and we can see that looks like the carnivores definitely survive longer remember the last three all those last three were all carnivores so maybe we want to do a test to test if there are any similarly different what we do this does spit out a bunch of data just not just plots i just showed you the plots but there's more including a log rank test which gives us a chi-squared of our p-value under the chi-square of 0.26 so that's not significant and we can see why the conference intervals overlap quite a bit there's not enough data to tell us if there's a real difference there does not appear to be but uh, we don't need to stop there sas is a lot easier to do um, hazard functions than r so let's do a, a life test again where instead of applying a survival let's pull a hazard this is a smooth hazard we can see here that 
you know, starts out there's like no risk at the beginning, that sort of flat curve here. But then it really shoots up, especially around time 30. Again, that big drop when we had like three die at once. And then it sort of levels out. We want to do a cumulative habit. We have to do a little more work, but we can do it and we can see it it goes up. And you see that this isn't at this top isn't at one, it's at three. This wasn't normalized. We could we could normalize it to get it to one, but it kind of tells us the same sort of thing. So there we have our SAS example. Okay, here, 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 here is an assessment to assess your knowledge of what we've talked about. The link is here and then it's available to click on in the description of this video below. So please take a moment to take that. Okay, let's finalize our intro talk here with a bit of an illustration of what's going on just to retread over a ground of what, what we're doing here with survival analysis. So I have these individual outcomes table I've thrown up for patients A through H over a certain time period. We see that for four of them, one, two, three, four, had an event shown by the red circle, they died. Two of them, D and H, survived past our time interval with the black circle, and then two more had sensory event, they dropped out of the study. So what we're doing with survival analysis is taking this information and then we're going to sort it like this. And then finally, we're going to take this information out and plot a survival curve from here. And we can see that you know, survival will drop as we go on. Censured events are shown here, but they don't tribute to a drop in survival because we don't have information about whether they survived or not. And then we see that survival is not at zero at our end of our time because two people actually survived. Great stuff there. So to summarize and conclude, survival analysis is used for time to event data. You follow a cohort over time for an event like death. The major types are survival time of a group, survival time across groups, and survival time based on factors. Survival curves and life tables are common visual visualization methods. And log rank tests and Cox regressions are common analysis methods. So tune in next time for a more detailed look at survival analysis module two, leaves and trees. With that, I will Blast your eyes with a variety of references. And then acknowledge the fact that, as always, this uh, is supported by a grant. So please cite the Bird Corps if you found this helpful. Thank you and have a Pterosaurus Day.